Turn to Romans chapter 6. We're continuing in our Roman series. Romans chapter 6, we'll be looking at uh, 15 through 23 this morning. So in one high school class, there was a, an, a, an English class, there was an assignment given. They were shown this, this painting. It's a Vincent van Gogh painting. Anybody familiar with this painting? It's uh, called Wheatfield with Crows. And the assignment for these high school students were they were to take 30 minutes. They were going to be timed. And they were to write nonstop whatever this painting, just by studying and looking at this painting, whatever feelings it provoked. And the kids were eating this up. They, they loved the assignment. And they got great joy out of just you know writing down their different interpretations and what kind of feelings it was uh, invoking, and they came up with all different, um, all different things. Um, then after the assignment was over, they were surprised when they turned the page and went to the next assignment, and it was the same assignment. They were to write for another 30 minutes about this same painting, not even a different painting. It was the same painting. But this time, they were given context. And they were told uh, by the teacher that this was the last painting that Vincent Van Gogh painted before he committed suicide. And that changed everything. <laughs> Just the way they looked at the painting, the way they thought about the painting, they thought about you know what he must have been going through when he when he painted uh, this this painting, and it changed their whole outlook uh, towards uh, this artwork of Vincent Van Gogh's. Context is vital, and it's especially vital uh, in, in Scripture. The Bibles that we read today, you know, they've been given chapters and verses that weren't originally there, and a lot of us, we have our favorite memory verse, right? Or we have what we call a life verse. I don't, mine's 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has, has come. And... But it's easy with that, with having these verses, the, the Bible's like one of the only books that we take, we take verses and we just cherry pick them out of context. And so it's easy to have a verse or a passage and not really understand the context of what the, the passage is, is saying, the greater whole. Or we might not understand the historical passage, right? We're in 2022 and... You know, the last book of the Bible was written like 2,000 years ago. And so that's a long period of time and cultures have changed and times have changed. And so context is, is especially important in Scripture. And so our passage this morning, needs some context. Uh, so what I want to do is just give you a, a brief outline of what is going on here. And you've seen me do this before where I've kind of talked about an overview of Romans, but the reason it's important is because Romans is a letter. It, we call it the book of Romans, but it's not, a, it's not a book that you would read in chapter one. Okay, I'm going to, you know, we read a lot of books. I'm going to read chapter one today. I'll read chapter two tomorrow or whenever I feel like it. But this was a letter that would have been read in one sitting. It would have been read to a congregation in, in one sitting. And so, it's important that we understand the overall context of Romans. So here's, here's what's going on in a nutshell. Paul is, the Apostle Paul, he is writing to a church comprised of both Jews and Gentiles. It's a mixed congregation. And he is writing to confirm the gospel in them. They're Christians already, but he wants to confirm the gospel and make sure that they understand um, the gospel. And we've said before that the gospel is something that it's not only something that unbelievers need, but we continually need, uh, we need the gospel. And so he starts off by just laying out the whole plan of God's salvation. And he says that the Gentile, the unbelieving world, right? Think of the unbelieving world has no excuse. And the reason that it has no excuse is because God has revealed himself through the things that he has made. Through nature. So in other words, human beings are, when we look at the world around us and we look at the stars in the sky and we even study bi biology or astronomy or, or whatever, it all points to a creator. We should see the world around us and be like, wow, who made this? But he says that the, the problem is, is that 
uh, the Gentile world has seen this and they have ignored the creator. And so they are without excuse. And because they have chosen to go their own way instead of follow after God, he's kind of just turned them loose. And then after that, he turns to the Jews and he says, well, hey, but you guys, you're no better. Because, yes, you have been given, you had the great privilege of, of receiving the promises of God and the promises through Abraham and all that kind of stuff. And, and you have been given the, the Torah, which we call the law. It's the first five books of Moses that has been entrusted to you so that you can be blessed and be a blessing uh, to the nations and then to the world so that you can shine the light of God. But the problem is, is you have this Torah, you have this law, but you haven't kept it. And so that's a problem. So you too are under sin. And so you're no better than the Gentiles. And he summarizes it like this. He says, so here's the thing. All people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All human beings are under sin and they fall short of the glory of God. Bible calls this death. Sin leads to physical death. Sin being in the world is the reason we have human death in the world. Because sin is just a power. It's not something that we do. It's a force in the world. And so it leads to death, but it also leads to spiritual death. And so when we sin, it, it alienates us from God. And so Paul says, all people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the good news is, and this is what Paul is getting to, there's good news here. And that that is that God has revealed a way to be right with him, a way to be reconciled to him and being relationship with him. He's revealed a way apart from the Torah, apart from the law. So the Jews, it's not their obedience to law, it's their faith in Jesus Christ. And though Gentiles, though we, in, in a sense, We've never had the law. We've never been under the law. I don't know if you knew that or not, but as Gentiles, as non-Jews, we've never been under the law. But Paul had also said, but with us, with us Gentiles, the rest of the world who, isn't, who aren't Jews, we had this law in the conscience that has been written on, the con, on our consciousness that tells us right from wrong. And we too haven't obeyed. But God, the good news is, is that he has made a way apart from Torah to be right with God. And it's that God loves us so much. And he did this by overriding sin and death with grace and life through his son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so it goes like this. Through faith in Jesus, we are now freed to live for God. Before we weren't freed, we were under sin, right? But now we've been freed from sin in order to live for God. So in Romans chapter 5, Paul implies this, that there is no sin that God's grace cannot cover. No matter how great the sin is, because I do believe, some people say, you have heard me say this before, some people say all sin is the same. The Bible doesn't teach that. It's that the blood of Christ can cover all sin. There is no sin, no, no, you know, spitting out your gum. I'm sorry, is not this, you know, on a, on a sidewalk where it's illegal to spit out your gum on a sidewalk is not the same as murder. It's just the, the blood of Christ covers all sin, which I think it makes it even more amazing. And it drives home this point is that grace by definition is undeserved favor. It's a gift. So now no matter how much you've sinned or, or how great your sin it's covered by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's what makes the gospel so amazing and wonderful. But that raises a question. And Paul starts to propose these expected questions that he would expect in chapter 6. He says, well, should we continue to sin so that God's grace looks even better? The thinking is, is like, okay, so if, if God's grace by definition is undeserved favor and it is a free gift and the greater the sin, the more God's, you know, grace, how we see how amazing it is because it even covers those sins that it covers all sin. Should we just keep on sinning so that it really makes the gospel look awesome and good? I was like, no way, dude. But actually that by no means in your Bible the Greek, it's dude there. <laughs> so he's like, no way, dude. 
through Jesus, through Jesus, by your faith in Jesus, you died to sin. He says, it's like, it's like baptism. You think of baptism. There's a spiritual baptism that happens in you. And when you call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says that you die to sin and you've been raised to new life. So no, you shouldn't go on sinning. The grace may abound. You're dead to sin. God calls you uh, dead to sin. He considers you dead to sin. And so Paul says, you need to consider yourself dead to sin. You need to start seeing yourself this way, that you are dead to sin and you are alive now to live for God. The chains have been broken, so now that you can begin living for your creator. That's the gospel. That's what Paul says. No, of course we shouldn't keep on sinning. The grace may abound. You're a new creation. That was my life verse, right? You're a new creation. You're new. You can start living for God now. You've been set free to. Start seeing yourself this way. Says sin can no longer master you since you aren't under the law. And now the Jews are like, wait a second. Sin can no longer master us because we're not under the law anymore. And so that brings up another question. Where's my other question here? Oh, there it is. Actually, I want to explain what it means not to be under the law. So remember I said the law, the reason I'm calling it Torah and making that distinction, which are the first five books of Moses, is because a lot of times we Christians now, when we think of the law, we think of the Ten Commandments. We automatically go to the Ten Commandments. And there's no place in the Bible where it's actually like, here are Ten Commandments, you know, and this is the law. The law is so much bigger than the Ten Commandments. It's the first five books. Well, Genesis is, is a lot of narrative. Exodus is a lot of narrative. But it's contained within those within the Torah is the law of, of God. And it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's all the, the sacrifices and, and so forth. And there's so many other there laws. I think they, people tried to figure it out. It's like 616. There's some discrepancies or disagreements on, on what it is. But just know that it's, it's, it's all those books contain the law. It's the law of of Moses. And um, this was the first covenant that was given to uh, Israel at Mount Sinai. And remember, it showed them how to not only be blessed when they would keep God's law, because God's law is good. Sometimes we assume God's law is, is bad now because we have the gospel, but the law is good, right? This was their means to, when they would keep the law, when they obey God, it's still true today. When you obey God, you're blessed. And when you obey God, it's, it's, it's good, and it blesses other people. And so they were to obey this law, be blessed, and be a blessing to the world. The problem was is that they had wicked hearts. They were under sin, and so they had no power to do so. And so that was the problem. There's God's good law, but they had no ability to do it, and they just kept screwing up over and over again and turning to other gods and turning away from God and rebelling against God. So the law was good, but it, it ended up only bringing condemnation. It, it actually, it, it, the way it worked, it, it ended up just showing them their sin even more. But Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, 24 and 25, he says, So then the law, Torah, was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So he said this was all part of God's plan. He put this law in place with Israel, right, so that they could, they could be a light. And it was their guardian until Christ came because he knew sin was going to be a problem and the Messiah was going to have to come and rescue them. He says now the, the, the faith has come through Jesus Christ. We're no longer under a guardian. The focus, our focus is all centered around not the Torah, right, but around Jesus Christ. Romans 3.28, earlier in Romans, he says, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And in Hebrews 8.13, it says, in speaking of a new covenant, the old covenant was the one at Mount Sinai when they were given the law. He makes the first one obsolete, Jesus does. And what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. And so he made it obsolete at the cross. But then in 70 AD, when the temple and the sacrificial system was destroyed, I mean, there's nothing left of the law. It's, it's vanished away. I mean, we have the Torah. But the law itself, there is no point 
in the law. Something better, Hebrews says, has come. So here's the thing. Believing Jews are no longer under the Torah. They're no longer under the law. They're under the gospel. They're under the gospel. And Gentiles, in order to come into the family of God, the family of Abraham, and under, in order to be a part of God's family, we don't have to adopt the, law, uh, the Torah, the law. We don't have to become Jews before becoming believers, you know, before becoming Christians. We are called to believe the gospel and look to the gospel. And so that's what it means that we're no longer under the law, but now it's through faith in Jesus Christ. And so that raised another question. Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? And that may sound like a confusing question to some. Some of you may sound like a stupid question. But listen to this. In other words, I think this question is, is, is it makes sense. In other words, they're saying this. So Paul, like a good Christian Jew, okay? Paul, the law taught us right from wrong. That's why we follow Torah, right? It it teaches us the way to live for God. It taught us right from wrong, and now you're saying we're free from it? We're not under it anymore? So Paul, are you implying that now we're free to sin? If it taught us right from wrong and we're freed from that, you're saying we're free to sin? Again, he says, no way, dude. Not at all, by no means. He says, you are set free from the law in order to pledge a new allegiance. So let's look at our passage this morning. Romans chapter 6. Starting in verse 15, we'll go through 23. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you were once slaves to sin, and now you've become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." says, I'm, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. Let me just say that that's really what preaching is. It's taking spiritual things and making it plain for us to understand. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, now you need to present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. But when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get, it leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, thank you for your word. So, the idea here is that you serve what you pursue. You serve what you pursue, what you pursue after, what you go after. That is what you serve. It's all, it's all a matter of allegiance. It's a matter of allegiance. Jesus says in Matthew uh, 6, 21 on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. What you value is where your heart is. Values aren't something that we just make up. You know, a lot of people say, well, I value this or I value this. It's kind of like pie in the sky of values. But values are already there. It's, it, it, that's our treasure. That's where our love and our passion is, is in our values. So values are something that you discover. So if you're wanting to discover your values for a business or whatever, first thing you need to do is start brainstorming. Hey, what are we good at? What do we do? What do we do well? What do we like to do? What are we passionate about? And then you're going to start discovering your values. There may be some values to decide, oh, man, I said I value honesty, but I don't really value honesty because I lie a lot. I kind of bend the truth for my business or whatever, and so I don't value honesty. 
right? So if you say you value something, that is something that you, you can have aspire values, like that's not really your value yet, but that's where you want to be. But values are things that are important to you as a business, as a church, as a, a person. And so that's what Jesus is saying. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So the things that you're pursuing, that's going to tell you where your heart's at, what you really value in life. Not your words, it's what you do. That shows you what you value. He also says that no one can serve two masters. Because what's going to happen is you're either going to hate the one and love the the other, you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. And in this case, the context was you can't serve God and money. But you can take that in your Bible and you can make a little asterisk by it and then you can draw a little, you know, space, you know, fill in the blank type thing and you can insert whatever. (laughs) Whatever your idol is, you cannot serve God in that cannot serve God in that. You can write sin in there. You cannot serve God in sin. You cannot pursue God in sin. Because what's going to happen is when you dabble in sin and when you pursue sin, God is not going to be your master. It's going to be it's going to be your master. It's going to be the one that has control over you. You will be devoted to that and not to God. We were not redeemed to continue to be enslaved to sin. We weren't, we weren't redeemed by Jesus in order to operate that way. Like Bob Dylan said back in the, I think it was 70s or early 80s, he had this period where he wrote like a gospel album and stuff. And, and he, he wrote, he says, you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And there's truth in that. I don't know where his heart was when he wrote that, but there's truth in that. (laughs) You're going to serve somebody. That's what Paul is saying here, is you are serving somebody. We think we're free. You know, we're independent. That's how our culture is. We're independent. No, you're serving somebody. And you're either serving Christ, you're either for him, or you're against him. And if you're not serving Christ, you're, you're serving the world, you're serving sin, you're serving the devil. And so that's what Bob Dylan was saying. You're going to have to serve somebody. Nobody escapes that. And so the idea, the question is, is which dog do you feed? Sin or righteousness? Old story of an old Cherokee Indian who was teaching his grandson about life. And he tells his grandson, he says, grandson, there is a fight that is going on inside of me. It's a terrible fight between two wolves. And one is evil. He's full of anger and envy, sorrow and regret. He's full of greed and and arrogance and self-pity, guilt and resentment, inferiority, that word, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He says, grandson, but the other wolf, it is good. It's full of joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence. Empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson says, Grandfather, which wolf will win? He says, the one that you feed. But here's the thing. That's not a biblical story. Here's the thing. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible would say that you were enslaved to that first wolf. That's what it means to be under sin. That means, that's what it means that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You were under that. That doesn't mean that everybody in the world is just purely evil, but they're, they're, they're chained to sin. It has a hold on them. They're enslaved to, to sin. It has power. It has a hold on them. You were enslaved to that first wolf, but the gospel says that you have been freed from that first wolf so that you can begin now feeding the second. And so we've been freed from sin. We've been freed from that wolf. And so the fear, especially for the Jewish Christians, was that trading the law, if we were to trade the law for grace, this thing you're talking about, grace, this free gift through Jesus Christ, through this Messiah, wouldn't that be being an enabler? My son this week, and I've heard the walls are thin, so he can probably hear this illustration right now probably rolling his eyes or turning red. I don't know. But 
Zane, he forgot, and I, for, I forgive him. I forgave him when he did it. But he forgot his dress shoes uh, this week. He had a choir uh, competition, and he, he left his dress shoes at home. And uh, so he calls me up. I'm still having coffee with my wife. I haven't left yet. And he's like, Dad, um, I left my dress shoes. You don't have to bring them if you don't want to or if you can't. He's like, no, I don't want you to go without. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And so I called my boss. And I said, hey, I'm going to be late to work. And, and he joked with me. He said, uh, he's like, man, he's never, he's never going to learn unless you make him go barefoot. <laughs> I was like, I know I'm such an enabler. But the Jews are like, but aren't you enabling? Like with this grace thing, you know, this free grace, this, aren't you enabling? Aren't you just encouraging people to sin? And Paul's point is this, is like, well, here's the thing, is like if you continue to sin, your allegiance is to sin. You're still enslaved to it, but you've been set free. You're a new creation. You're dead to sin. You're alive in Jesus Christ. So being separated from the law, you know, which you couldn't obey in the first place, now it's been all wrapped up under Jesus who fulfilled the law, right? And now he is your focal point by faith, and you follow him and you obey him. Right? There's things written in the law, you know, this moral code that is just like the universal God code, you know? <laughs> and the Ten Commandments contain that, right? And it's not that those things are washed away, those commandments. It's just like the whole law, we're not a part of that anymore, and Jesus, now we just look to Jesus and we obey Jesus, right? And what happens when we fall short? When you fall short, when you fell short in obeying the law and the Torah, uh, it only brought condemnation, right? You're under a curse. You have to keep the whole law. But with Jesus, we follow after him. And when we fall short, the blood of Jesus says, it's, it's good. I got your back. That's why it's the gospel. That's why it's good. That's why it's grace. Doesn't mean we're not obedient. Doesn't mean we keep in sin, Right? We just have a better way, a much better way. And so it's all about allegiance. And those allegiances, you know, those two wolves, those two dogs, they both have consequences. One leads to death, Paul says, and the other, it leads to righteousness and, 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 and sanctif sanctification. Sanctification is transformation, right? Right? It leads to us to being more who God created us to be, more Jesus, more fully human, more who we were created to be. That's sanctification. And so both have a snowball effect. One, righteousness, when we serve righteousness, it's transformative and it's, it's for our good. heard me say before, engaging, you know, just talking about our faith and having Bible studies, that doesn't transform. Those are tools to transform, but engaging our faith. When we actually go out and engage our faith, it has a transforming effect. It leads to more righteousness. It snowballs. The more we walk in righteousness and faith, the more we grow in righteousness and faith. To walk in righteousness is life-giving. But Paul is saying that the opposite is true as well. When you walk in sin, it leads to more sin, and its ultimate end is death. It leads you away from God. It alienates you from, from God, the life-giving source. And so a Christian dabbles in something that, you know, they think is okay, you know, and maybe we look at the rest of our lives and we're like, hey, man, you know, 90% of my life is good, right? So this little area over here, I'm just going to kind of keep that from God. I'm going to kind of do this thing. I'm going to kind of ignore God and plug my ears over here and just kind of hide this away. And I'm going to dabble and, and walk in this sin over here. But the rest of it's good. I'm, I'm good. And what, it, what ends up happening is it just snowballs. That's what happens. It snowballs. And why? Because Jesus already told us you can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. So you say, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm going to give a little bit to sin over here. He's like, nope, you do that, and, and, and it's going to snowball. You're going to serve sin, and you're not going to serve me. And that's what happens. And what seems small, suddenly we're drawn away from God, and we're wondering when the world happened. And it started because we thought, well, we could dabble with sin and be okay. God says, no, that's not life-giving. That brings death. So that's why he says things like, man, if your right arm causes you to sin, you need to cut it off and throw it away. 
It's not telling you to literally cut off your arm. You need to, you need to prune those things. You need to get them out of your life because it's going to lead to death and it's going to snowball on you. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Don't walk after death. Walk after Jesus. And so the important thing here is that we, we switch allegiances. And that's one of the things I think when, when people come to Christ and the way we present the gospel sometimes, hey, you know, say this prayer after me, Jesus, will you, will you come into my heart and forgive me of my sins? Oh, yes, child of God, amen. Well, one, we're supposed to make disciples. That's ongoing, right? We're not just supposed to make converts, right? We're making followers of Jesus. But two, like the gospel, like the very word repentance, repentance doesn't mean confession. We think of confession, you know, like forgive me of my sins. That's not repentance. Like I asked Courtney, you know, I, did, I sinned against her. Or I did something wrong and I say, hey, would you forgive me? That part isn't repentance. Repentance is like I changed my, I, the sorrow I feel in my heart that I'm going to change my ways and I'm going to view things differently. I realize what I did to her hurt her. You know, I said some things that I shouldn't have. Me, me wanting to make amends and, make, and not do that anymore, that's repentance. So when we come to Jesus, like all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, my sin is bad. God is good. <laughs> and I'm going to follow after God now. That's repentance. It's not being perfect. It's, 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 it's a change of allegiance. Right? I realized, maybe I didn't realize before, but my allegiance was to this life. In this way of being, but now my allegiance is to Jesus. Does that make sense? That's what repentance is. You change your mind about things. You're looking at it different. And so it's important that we we intentionally switch allegiances. I um I worked for KSBJ for about six six months. I worked for their ticketing division. It was a part-time uh, job that I really enjoyed. And, and the re- reason I enjoyed it is because I enjoyed, I enjoyed the atmosphere. I enjoyed the people, right? You got to know the DJs and stuff like that. I, uh, I got to go to free shows, free Christian shows, because I would work the ticketing uh, thing, you know, that scan tickets and we'd do all the setup and stuff like that. Got to meet like Tim Tebow and some, you know, different artists, uh, you know, uh, singers and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed it. And there was a position that came up for the full time in my position, a full time job came up in that position and I wanted to keep working there. And my boss, which I had become good friends with, um, he sat me down and he's like, Scott, I, I know you want this job. He goes, but here's the thing, man, you've got pastoring written all over you and your allegiance is the pastoring. Your alignment is the pastoring. And I'm telling you, man, is like, you're not going to be able to function in this job properly. And I was, I was disappointed. I was actually mad. Like, well, how, the, how in the world am I supposed to have a job, you know? <laughs> Even when I'm pastoring, how am I supposed to have a job if it's, you know? And the, the thing was, is I was also not passionate about selling tickets, you know? I just liked working there in that environment, you know? But it, it wasn't really what I wanted to do with my life, you know what I'm saying? And so he, he needed somebody who was really passionate uh, about, about that job. And he saw that that wasn't me. He loved me, but he saw that that wasn't me. And so I work another job uh, now, too, as a graphic designer, video editor, and I love it. And so the thing is, is I'm also passionate about graphic design. Ministry is my first um, priority, right? But I'm, I'm passionate about that, too. And so, so it all works out, right? But God says that we cannot be passionate about him and sin at the same time. We can't be passionate about both. When we're aligned to sin, we cannot function in our true calling. And so when we've got these little areas that we're going to continue to walk in sin, we cannot live out our calling. We're called to be a blessing in the world. We're called to the Great Commission. We're we're called to to share the gospel with our, our lips, with our life, and with our love. We're called to live that out. We're called to glorify God. We're called to be, to be God's image bearers, to be his mirrors in the world. And we can't do that when we uh, have an allegiance to sin. And so it's important that we consciously, uh, say that word consciously, switch allegiances. It doesn't happen by accident. It's like, no, I, my allegiance is to Jesus 
Jesus doesn't just set you free. He were bought with a price. We need to switch our allegiances. I challenge you to put your allegiance under a microscope. Like really look, look at it and think about it. Has your allegiance been, has it been tested? Your allegiance to Christ. Because here's the thing, and I don't mean this to be, I don't mean this to shame anybody or be a jerk or whatever, but some professing Christians are not servants of Christ. We're believers, right? But we're not servants of Jesus Christ. It's just happenstance obedience. What do I mean by happenstance? Well, so you're not fornicating, right? You're not fornicating. You're not in a fornicating relationship. But it's happenstance because it's only because, really, if you were to put it under a microscope, it's really only because you don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend right now. But if you did, there's a little spark between you two. You jump right in it. And so there's these areas of your life, you just happen not to be sinning in that area, but really it's just because it's a coincidence. It's happenstance. If you value sin, when you're tempted, you're going to bear its fruit. And if you value Jesus, when tested, you will bear his fruit. So it's, it's, it's important that we get our values in alignment with Christ now, right? We know that who we serve now, we define ourselves now so that when we're tempted and when we're tested, right? And that's what the Bible talks about, you know, are you, are you, are you, are you gold, right? Or are you, are you stubble, you know, are you hay, are you fodder? What are you? What is there? What is your faith? We were bought with a, a price. We weren't just set free for a free reign. We were, we were bought with a price by the blood of Jesus Christ. Look how Paul defines his allegiance. Like right off the bat, when you go to Romans 1, verse 1, he starts off the letter, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Bond servant. Some of your translations may even say slave. He was a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. He knew his calling. He knew who he served, and he starts his letter with that. And look how he redefines the Christian's allegiance in our passage this morning in verse 17 and 18. You know, he says these things. No, we shouldn't continue in sin, but thank God that you who were once slaves of sin, you have become obedient from the heart. You know, allegiance has to do with the heart. You know, it's from the heart. Now you become obedient because you want to, right? Again, remember we talked about the looking at the law as a bad thing, you know? Or, you know, let's translate that to New Testament, the commandments of God. But man, like, how did David then write that it was honey on his lips? I mean, he wanted to serve God, right? We want to serve God. You were once slave to sin. Now you become obedient from the heart. You want to. You want to be. You want to obey. You realize that there's life in obedience to Christ. There's wisdom. There's goodness. That's the way you were designed. You have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Paul's helping the church to redefine themselves. And having been set free from sin, Paul says, now you become slaves to righteousness. You just weren't set free. You changed allegiances. You switched allegiances. So allegiance at its core is is what faith is. Allegiance is at the core of faith. We think of faith as belief. But faith, it's a Greek word, pistis, and it's multidimensional. Faith is not just, not just belief in something. It's, it's trust. It's dependence. It's loyalty. It's faithfulness. It's allegiance. And your words alone, they don't tell the story. We can say we're allegiant all day. Your life is what tells the story of what you're allegiant to. And so it's important that the, the we believers, we get this right, right? That the gospel is not just a, a, like a declaration of independence from sin. The gospel is a declaration of our dependence on Jesus Christ. 
Amen? Does that make sense? Amen. And so that's what Paul's saying. That's what he's saying. Of course we don't. No. Of course we don't go on sinning. (laughs) We're new creations. You've got a new Lord. You've got a new king. There's a new king in town. And when, when you when you died to sin and, and, and you you woke up spiritually, man, you realize there's a new king in town and then and that's Jesus Christ, and that's who I want to follow. Amen. Where does your allegiance lie this morning? Let's pray. And then um uh we'll worship and if anybody needs prayer uh for anything, I would love uh I'd love to pray. Uh, for you. Hey, if you want to pray with each other, pray with each other. Lord, we thank you um, for the gospel. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. Lord, we thank you for this letter to the Romans. Lord, you said that um, these things which are written down in Scripture were written for our benefit, Lord. And I just pray that it it, uh, blessed people this morning. It challenged us. It grew us, Lord. And uh, you continue that renewal process in us. Uh, Thank you for your church. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.